Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. This next project on the bench is a Seiko 7006-7189 from November of 1973 that belongs to a good friend of mine. He picked it up off of eBay a little while ago. Uh, he's sort of getting into vintage watches and uh, has a, an affinity for Seikos, which, which I like, and uh, said it was stopping on occasion and running just rather poorly, wanted to know if we could take a look at it. So I got the watch from him and I'm just doing an initial inspection here and the quick set seemed to work okay, but yeah, pulling the crown out and trying to move the hands, it uh, it is not feeling good. It's incredibly difficult to turn. And as in, you'll notice there, the second hand stopped moving. So I'm, I'm keeping all, all of this in one shot. Keep your eyes on the minute hand and the second hand as we try this a few times. So we shake the watch to get it working again. And I'm going to go ahead and try to pull, move it again. And you see the minute hand kind of nudge a little bit and the second hand just stops. That's definitely not supposed to do that. And at this point, I'm trying to think of, you know, what could cause this. Uh, there's a few things. But it, I mean, it's just, it's just so odd. I've never actually seen one do this before. This is something totally new. But there, did you see that? How the minute hand kind of goes backwards and there, I kind of overpowered it and I'm moving it, moving the hands around, but the second hand is not working. And those hands are way too difficult to move. That crown is, it's, it's, it, it feels just awful. It's five times as hard as it should be. We're going to shake it and get it going again. And I'm just going to test it one more time here. We'll pull the crown out. And I didn't have it out all the way. There we go. Now we can try. See that minute hand kind of nudge. And now I actually moved it. And now the second hand went backwards. <laughs> yeah, this thing is, um, I can definitely see why he's saying he's having trouble with it. This thing here definitely has some issues. We will, uh, we'll find more than a few in this watch when we dig into it. But outside of that, I'm just going to take a look at the rest of the case on this watch. He, he, uh, you know, in our conversations, he, he told me, you know, he likes kind of, you know, old scuffed up watches, you know, he said those scratches kind of tell a story. And, uh, he, he thought that he decided he didn't want me to do any case refinishing on this. And he said, if you wanted to try to do it later, you know, he, he'd give it a shot and he's a pretty handy guy. So he'd probably end up doing a real good job on it too. The crystal has a crack in it. And, uh, right there on the edge of that case, you can see some bumps where that thing's taking some hits over its ears, but there's a close up of that crack on the crystal. And I kind of had an adventure trying to source the right crystal for this thing. But this case, it doesn't, I mean, it looks like it's in original condition. It is kind of scratched up and all that, but it tells a story. You know, this watch has been worn a lot. And, uh, if those things could tell a story, it probably has some pretty, pretty cool ones. So we're just going to leave the case as is. We're going to clean it up thoroughly and, um, you know, go from there. But he, uh, he likes that kind of stuff. And I, I completely respect that opinion. I, I personally, I enjoy the process of, kind of working on cases and refinishing them, but it kind of in the watch world, it's kind of 50, 50 on that. A lot of people, some people like it. Some people don't but take a look at that. Look at all that gunk inside those lug recesses where this watch may have been cleaned for sale on eBay, but they didn't take the bracelet off to clean it. Take a look at all that, all that stuff. That's like a treasure trove of DNA for the past 50 years, but it almost looks like rust, but I'm just going to take some pigwood here and I'm just kind of, just very quickly and not a thorough cleaning at all, but just to kind of show you, see, I, I mean, it comes off, so it, it's not very difficult to clean, but that'll all come apart. But you know, those CSI folks, you know, they need to, they need to start looking at watches for DNA because that stuff there's wow. So the case back was too difficult to open with the magic eight ball. So I had to move it over to the big tool, but we got it off here. I'm going to go ahead and remove the gasket. This gasket is not in terrible condition. It's it's on its last stages of useful life, but we're going to go ahead and replace it anyway. Case back doesn't have any markings inside of it. If this watch has been serviced, um, they didn't mark it. But as soon as I opened it up, I found problem number one. 
and why this thing's keeping terrible time. Take a look at this hairspring. We're going to zoom in on this thing, but this is not good. See how that hairspring's touching each other? And we're going to go ahead and rotate the view around here. Take a look at this. This will cause massively erratic timekeeping. <laughs> Take a look at that. That can be caused by a few things. My first thought when I saw that was that it was magnetized. Um, I put it on the magnet demagnetizer, just, you know, the complete watch in there, and it did not seem to do anything. Um, if the hairspring is really dirty or there's a bunch of oil on it, it can cause the coils to stick together also. We're going to go ahead and just pull this balance out. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to take a look at this thing and, you know, get an idea of what's causing this and find out just what it is. My curiosity is kind of getting the better of me at, better of me at this point because I, you know, I can disassemble the whole watch and address the balance during that process. But I just wanted to get my hands on this thing. So we'll go ahead and pull this balance out of here. And on these watches, you can pull it out with it still in the case. It's not very difficult. Take a look at this. That is not good. So then I took this balance complete as it sits like you see it here, and I put it on the demagnetizer. And now this is what it looks like after I it was demagnetized that way. That was definitely magnetism causing that issue. But the terminal curve right here where that arrow is, that last curve where the, the regulator arm swings, the gap needs to be even all the way across. And that was not. So I'm going to attempt uh, this to fix this. Uh, this is not something I do very often. This is the one thing I absolutely hate doing. I do not like doing hairspring manipulation because it's just such a fiddly process. It is so easy to make a mistake and then render it, you know, unfixable, at least at my skill level. So this is all going to be one shot, completely unedited. This is not a very involved hairspring repair, uh, but any hairspring repair is delicate. So I'm using my finest tip tweezers and my finest oiler here, and I'm just massaging. I'm holding the, holding the hairspring there, and I'm massaging the hairspring in the direction I want it to go very, very lightly. I mean, extremely lightly, as light as almost I can possibly do it. So I work, I'm going to work that around. And what I'm trying to do is make the gap between that terminal curve and the, the coil just on the inside of it, even all the way across. And I started to get kind of comfortable with it. And you can see that, you know, it, it's starting to get there. It's, it's already start, starting to look a little bit better. And then I went too far. And then I went, when I overcorrected. <laughs> And then that last one got it pretty close. And at this point I was thinking I was good and I'm just kind of looking around. I've, I think I want to make one more adjustment to it. Um, so here we're going to go ahead and kind of get it repositioned again. I'm going to make one more small adjustment and it probably doesn't even really do much of anything, but there we go. I figured at this point that's that terminal curve is pretty darn even all the way across. And I don't want to press my luck too much because this is delicate. So I mounted the hairspring on the balance cock without the balance. And I put it the stud in and put the regulator in. And what you want is to see that center call it directly over that jewel. And that thing was looking pretty good. So we're going to we are reattaching the hairspring to the balance. And you can see those marks at the 12 o'clock position of the balance rim where I marked where that stud goes. So I get that started and we'll take it over and move it over to our staking set. And I'm just very, very gently going to press this hairspring back into place. Uh, there's no tapping or anything, no hammering, definitely. This is just completely with the pressure of your fingers. Very light touch. But we'll get that back on. And I mount that up back to the balance and we'll clean it thoroughly and then uh, adjust it later. But we're going to go ahead now and continue work on disassembling this movement and see what else this thing throws at us. So we got the movement ring out and now I want to remove the crown. So I'm depressing the setting lever spring with my tweezers. And then that releases it so we can pull the crown out, drop it there. But here we go. We'll get this thing back in frame and you can just take a quick look at this thing. That gasket there is pretty much shot. It's going to get a new one anyway. 
Now we can go ahead and pull the, separate the movement from the case. So I'll do that. Just give it a little quick tap. That probably doesn't really do anything, but it's just something I've always done. And pull this out. And one thing I noticed on here, I mean, with this, this watch here, we're going to reinstall the crown, by the way, so if I can try to align the hands, but the dial and hands on this thing are in real nice shape. But take a look at what happens here. I'm going to try to align the hands. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. I don't know. Somebody leave a comment. Let me know if I'm wrong, but um, I've never run into that before. So <laughs> that was a new one to me. There we go. I'm just playing around. This thing is so difficult to adjust. I mean, those hands are just, its it was unreal. I've never felt one that tight. You know, when I was doing this, my, you know, I was thinking, well, uh, maybe have a cannon pinion problem or something. I mean, that, that second hand rotating like it was, even, especially with that pallet fork still in there and that wheel train should not be able to freely move. That's not good. But, you know, all we can do at this point is just take it apart and see what's in there. So got some plastic over the dial and I'm just using my tools here to gently lift those hands off. Those hands are in phenomenal shape. Uh, the dial's in great shape. There's a few tiny, tiny little marks on it. Uh, but this thing is just fantastic. I mean, look at that. That thing's just gorgeous. So I definitely see why he picked it up. Uh, and that, that old, that crystal was a little bit scratched up, but it was hiding a gorgeous dial underneath it. So I'm just using some Rodico at first, just to pick off what I can. There's two dial feet screws on here that are on the back side of the movement. That's the second one there. I've already loosened up the other one. And they're just kind of ex screws with eccentric heads on it. And uh, when you turn it, it'll either kind of press into the dial feet or move away from it and release tension off of them. And we remove, move them away. And that frees up the dial and we can just go ahead and separate it just like this. That thing sure is pretty. I mean, Seiko, I mean, gosh darn. For the amount of money that they charge for those watches, and even when you can pick them up for today, it's hard. You're hard pressed to find a dial that pretty. Um, that's just unreal. So the dial ring on here, uh, it's kind of a tight squeeze around those dial feet. So I'm being very gentle when I remove it. I'll go ahead and flip this dial over. I'll get the case back in here real quick, just so they can compare the two. Both of them reference November of 73. Um, that's, that's great. I mean, it, honestly, I don't, I don't know if it would matter if it was an original dial or not. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. This one here is an original Seiko dial. It looks great. So disassembling the movement, we're going to begin by removing this day wheel and it's held in place by this little C clip. So we'll go ahead and get that out of the way. Then I'm just going to use some Rodico to lift it off. There's that little star gear underneath it. That's what uh, makes that wheel turn. And that's the day driving wheel. We need to go ahead and get that removed before we can remove this cover plate. And like on the 7002s or 7005s are very similar movements to these. It's just they don't have a, a day function, so you don't have that part to mess with. Now we can need to remove our day jumper. There's two screws that hold this down, and those also screw down and are also what hold the cover plate in place on that side. There's four screws holding that cover plate to the watch, and these are two of those four. We'll get these two screws removed and get that day jumper out of the way. Now we can go ahead and remove these other two screws. And so this is the follow-up video to the 1964 Hamilton uh, giveaway that we just completed. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who, if, you, if you've watched that video, at the time of this recording, there's about 5,000 people who've watched that video. That's pretty phenomenal. Um, so we did the giveaway. I think it was a success. The winner of it. Uh, I mean, he watched that video like two hours after it was uploaded and, um, he left a comment, sent me a very nice email, uh, told me a story about, you know, how he kind of got into time pieces and about his great grandfather's pocket watch. I kind of have a, sim a, a strikingly similar story and, um, but real nice guy. So, uh, it's the weekend right now. Uh, although we're nearing, I'm, we're nearing on the eat. We're in the evening of Sunday, but, um, his watch is going to ship out to him 
tomorrow morning and he'll get tracking and he'll have it this week. But, uh, I'm really pleased with it. I, um, I, we've gotten a bunch of good responses. So, um, thanks again to everyone. And what was great about that is someone asked me, they said, well, when's, you know, they said, Hey, thanks for doing the giveaway. When's the next one going to be? And so, uh, they made a suggestion. They said, what about 5,000 subscribers? And that sounded good to me. So, um, I guess that's what we're going to do. Uh, I, I, I already agreed to it basically. So we're the next giveaway is going to be when the channel hits 5,000 subscribers. I don't know if that's going to be in a month or in a year. Um, I don't know, but, um, I think it's fitting as many Seikos as we have on this channel that we give away a vintage Seiko. Uh, I've got a couple in my drawer, but I have a couple ideas also. I've been thinking about it since that, that person left me that comment and, um, I want it to be something cool. So when the time comes, whenever that is sooner, rather than, you know, sooner or later, we'll, uh, we'll do another giveaway. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on if you liked the format of the last one. So, um, if you have any ideas on how to change it, maybe make it better or, or what, but we'll, uh, I'm open to suggestions, but I'm really pleased with how it turned out. So we removed that Canon pinion there and that Canon pinion was on there tight. Let me tell you. I know it doesn't really look that way in the video just because I kind of went through it and those, that Canon pinion puller I've got, you know, there's a good amount of leverage on there, right? Even if it's difficult, that thing's going to yank it off there. But that Canon pinion was super duper tight. And, um, I'm thinking that was definitely the cause or at least one of the causes of some of the issues that we saw during inspection. So we're getting the keyless works removed and we got almost all of it there. There's the yoke and the yoke spring. That's all in one part. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove the setting lever. If I can get my tweezers on it. There we go. There's a setting lever. Now we can go ahead and pull the stem and the clutch wheel out. So there comes the stem. There's the clutch wheel or sliding clutch or whatever you want to call it. No winding pinning on this one. This one is an automatic only, so there's no manual winding on this particular movement. But now we can go ahead and flip this watch over and start disassembly of the rear side of the watch. So the first thing I want to do is remove this second reduction wheel, and that has a reverse threaded screw. But if you're going to remove power from the watch, and because we took this thing apart, you know, with, with the balance running, there's still power in this mainspring. So before you can remove that power in the mainspring, you need the second reduction wheel off. You need the automatic works disconnected from the ratchet wheel before you can basically unwind it. So by removing this wheel and man, that thing is dirty. Take a look at that. Goodness. But I went ahead and released power at that point. It's not really on video, but I did right there. Now we can go ahead and remove the ratchet wheel. And if I would unscrew the screw all the way, it'd be a lot easier to take it off. I actually do that a couple times in this video <laughs> where I have like half of a thread left and I go in there to try to pull the screw out and it doesn't want to go. It's having one of those days, I guess. There's the ratchet wheel coming off. Just dirty, pretty good shape otherwise. So the rear bridge on here has three different screws holding it in. And I put an arrow on there. Take a look at all that grease on the end of that paw lever. I mean, that makes it look a lot worse than it is. Um, that's Seiko's S4 grease, I'm sh surely, that was on there. So, I mean, that's that's black looking and dark, and it kind of gums up and looks like that when it gets old, and it does a lot more harm than good when it gets this age. But it's actually a really good grease otherwise when it's, you know, during its service life. But here we go. We'll go ahead and pull this third screw out. And I'd really like to get y'all's thoughts in the comments. If you like this kind of the, the way I'm doing these close up shots, it takes a lot more work to edit the videos. And I'm kind of still learning the right ways to readjust cameras and lighting and how I, how I edit, a, edit them. And I, I've changed it up a few things in the last couple of videos. Um, but if, if you kind of like this direction, I'd really like to hear from you. It It's a lot of work. Um, and if it's, you know, if it's not worth the effort, you know, it's not worth the effort, but me personally, I, I like it a lot, but it does take twice as long to put these videos together just because the editing is such a manual process. 
I need to start learning about faster ways to do that. So we pulled the bridge off and it kind of moved a couple of plates around. There's a bunch of old dried up lubricant and stuff. So I put the click spring back on just for the purposes of showing where it goes. And we'll go ahead and disassemble this again. That there is the fifth wheel. I'm sorry, fourth wheel, sorry. That's the third wheel. And it's kind of ironic. I mean, you can, the way those things line up, you can kind of see the pivots on those. That one, those looked pretty decent. That fourth wheel that has the second sand that's on it. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I was curious if that thing was going to be bent or not just because of how odd that second sand was acting. But actually, I mean, at first glance, it looked pretty good. But uh, now we're going to go th and remove this pallet fork and pallet fork bridge. So we're going to pull these two screws off here. I'm going to try my best not to do what I did in my last video where I just uh, a bit heavy handedly got, went through and tried to remove that pallet fork bridge. And I got lucky that I didn't damage anything. I mean, it was fine in the end, but um, I did it incorrectly. So now I'm just kind of breaking tension on this thing and moving it around and being extremely gentle. I mean, this is how I should have been done it on the last one. It takes longer to get it done, but it's a lot safer. But now we managed to get lift that thing off without hurting anything. I'm just kind of readjusting it in my tweezers here off camera. Now you can just kind of see it there. Now we can pull off our pallet fork. There we go. And that top pivot on that pallet fork had some um, had some marks on it. Uh, I think it was just dirt or something. There goes the click spring. And the balance wheel, or the, uh, pardon me, the mainspring barrel. And then here comes the escape wheel. And I was remember looking in the camera on this too, and this pivot here on that one, the, um, the top pivot on that also had a lot of dirt and stuff on it. It didn't look scratched or bent or worn, but it was definitely dirty. But now we can go ahead and remove the center wheel bridge. And there's another screw that I didn't unscrew all the way. So <laughs> there we go. And at this point here, the battery on my first camera died on me, the one that's kind of directly in front of the watch. So we're kind of stuck with this angle, but no big deal. That bridge came off pretty easily. Now we can pull our center wheel out. There we go. This watch is in decent shape. You know, it, um, it's, I, th I think it's run for a really long time without being worked on. So now let's go ahead and disassemble the automatic works. And this one here is just brilliantly simple. Four parts, that's it. So we need to remove the C-clip and there's really no way for me to do it on camera up close where you can see what I'm doing without me risking having that C-clip fly off. So I got to cover it in plastic, kind of get my fingers over it, but pop that C-clip off. And now once that's done, we can separate the first reduction wheel very gently from the plate. Here we go. The Paul lever is still attached to it. So we'll go ahead and separate that out. And it's those three pieces and the C-clip. And then technically the second reduction wheel. And that's the automatic works on this brilliantly simple, highly efficient magic lever system. They're just great. So here I am going to disassemble the mainspring barrel and Seiko never designed these. They didn't want people servicing these. They wanted these replaced as units. So I've kind of with a few attempts in Rodico where I finally got it kind of sturdy in there. I'm using the razor blade to kind of separate those two pieces. And I have a screwdriver in my other hand to use as very light leverage. And uh, once I kind of get one edge of it popped up, we'll go ahead and do that. And these, these are definitely serviceable. You just got to be careful, you know, don't mar up the barrel trying to take it out, but you don't have to, you know, buy a whole replacement sets. You can service these if you, if you can get the case open without mangling it. And I, I mean, I mangled my first couple before I ever kind of figured out the right technique, uh, at least that works for me uh, to do it. But, uh, but yeah, they're, they're definitely doable now. Now we can remove the mainspring and I like to just kind of get my my brass tweezers in there to make sure I'm not marring anything and get several coils unwound this way. And that way it's a lot easier for me to get my fingers underneath it and then finish unwinding it. Like you see here, here we just finish it up. Let's just take a look at this mainspring. 
on the bench. See what it looks like. And that's pretty darn flat. Not out of shape. I mean, that's got to say that's, I mean, that mainspring looks really good. One thing about Seiko mainsprings, the factory ones, uh, the bridle, that tip you see on the left is generally thicker. That bridle piece will be thicker than the mainspring itself. And um, like if you buy replacement Swiss mainsprings for these, I mean, yeah, they work. But um, those bridles on those are generally be the exact same size. So if I like to reuse the Seiko mainsprings when I can. So I'm doing some inspection just on the jewels before we do pre-cleaning. And that third wheel bottom jewel looks pretty filthy, but it's just dirty. But we're going to go ahead and start doing some pre-cleaning. <music> So we got the pre-cleaning done and uh, I didn't show every single part, but I did that on almost all the major components. Now we're going to go ahead and load up the cleaning baskets and get this thing ready to go through the machine. I keep all the screws out separately and I have them organized separately and I clean those manually. Uh, I generally don't like to mix those up, but uh, we'll put this thing through the cleaning machine. There's one wash cycle and three rinse cycles and that is followed up by a drying cycle. And while I have your attention here on this machine, <laughs> I'd like to let everyone know we created a Patreon channel for this page. I surely appreciate everyone's support. I'd like to say thanks to Donald, Darren, Matt, and Andrew, and our newest members, Danilo, Dale, Norris, JC, Ben, and Charles. Um, thank you all so much for your support. It really means a lot to me. Everything that comes in through Patreon goes right back into this channel. I don't keep any of it personally. At 100% of the funds go to support this channel, be it parts, tools, project watches, um, you name it. So uh, thank you again for your support. If anyone would like to join, the link is on your screen. And um, I sure do appreciate it. Everyone gets a thank you packet in the mail, regardless of what level you sign up at. So um, I know I said thank you about five times already, but I don't know any better words than that. Uh, any more truthful words than that. It does mean a lot to me. So thank you so much. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to get these balance jewels cleaned and lubricated. You saw me get the first one lubricated and clean there. And we're going to go ahead and put this spring back into place. And I'm going to keep this, all this in one shot. Kind of got lucky on, I had, you know, two of these and both of them were not very difficult. So I'm getting that first lug in and just rotating it around. And every time, anytime I've got any tension on this thing whatsoever, I try to at least have one of my tweezers inside of that spring and uh, touching the jewel. That way, if it does decide to go flying, that my tweezers will catch it. But you can see the oil ring in that one. So now that that top one's in, uh, we're gonna go ahead and remount this main plate in the holder, showing the dial side up. And I'm gonna go through the same process with that jewel. So I've already cleaned this one and put it back together. We're gonna go ahead and use our automatic oiler to lubricate that. And that is super close up. And I mean real close up because the tip of that needle on that oiler is so, it's almost hard to see with your eye uh, without magnification. It is so incredibly thin. Go ahead and get this one dropped in. You can see that nice round oil ring right in the middle of that jewel. That's looking really nice. So I dropped this spring in into a really good spot. So we're gonna go ahead and put this left side in. So there's one edge in and I'm gonna rotate this around and the second one in real quick and rotate it the other way. And there's our third one. And that is just beautiful. That's uh, that's about as easy as it gets on those. 
but then my OCD kicks in and I look at that and I'm like, ah, it's not dead center. There we go. That's looking a lot better. OCD is a blessing and a curse in watchmaking, by the way. It can sometimes really take up a lot of your time trying to make something absolutely perfect, especially if you upgrade your magnification, you end up doing that more and more. <laughs> now we're going to take a look at this balance after we got it all put back together. And they got to say that that mainspring is looking good. It's breathing really well. I'm really pleased with it. Um, it just, it looks like a million bucks compared to where it was before. So just double checking the flatness of the hairspring as well. I'm going to rotate this up and it's really hard to see, but if that main spring was bent, you'd kind of see it lifting up on one side, but that's looking really flat. And I also want to check the placement of the impulse jewel with this balance at rest. So here we'll zoom in that impulse jewels up top. And then the jewels for the pallet fork and the escape wheel are below it. And you can see they're all in a straight line. With that balance at rest, with it in line with those as close to center as you can get it, it'll minimize the amount of beat error that we get when you, when you first bring up the watch. So um, I was really liking what I was seeing there. Just um, so all good stuff. So before we can assemble the main watch, I like to get all my, you know, lubricate or all my, all the components and kind of sub assemblies put back together. So here we're going to get the mainspring and barrel and arbor all put back together. So I'm putting some breaking grease on the sides. That's Seiko S4 grease that I kind of spread around on the edge. And I pre lubricated that spring, by the way, before I put it in the winder, that's actually why it's sticking to the winder just a touch is because I pre lubricated that with grease before I put it in the winder happens sometimes, but no big deal. And I'm putting a little dab of oil on the inside lip of that bottom part of that mainspring barrel. That's where the arbor is going to rub up against. Speaking of the arbor, we'll go ahead and get this arbor put in. This one went in without too much, putting up too much of a fight. Sometimes they can be ornery and uh, <laughs> make your life difficult sometimes. But uh, I find it's best if I just step away for a moment when that happens. And I can usually come back and get it in on a second or third attempt. And a dab of lubrication for the top part of that where the barrel lid's going to be in contact with that upper part of the arbor. There's the barrel lid. We'll go ahead and move this over to our tool. You don't have to use one of these tools. And this one here is a cheap version of the, the name brand. I mean, it was five or six dollars, but it just kind of has a, you know, a curved inner edge on it. That way it can accommodate multiple size barrels. The inside of the, that cap on the top is flat. And so when you press down on it, it puts even pressure all the way around. And now when I take it out, I'm just rotating this in my tweezers. I checked in shake on the barrel and uh, itself. And then I'm also rotating it just to make sure that that lid is closed and flush all the way around and everything was looking really good. So the other sub assembly I want to pre-install before we get going here is the automatic works. So I've used HP 1300 on uh, some of these first transmission wheels before I, uh, uh, Seiko S4 is actually what the manual calls for. I've found that both actually work quite well, but, uh, I had the S4 grease out and I said, you know what, we'll just do it this way, but you need to be very liberal with your application of that grease on there. I mean, put a lot, it actually, the manual, it looks like it's in a puddle and, you know, un underwater as it were, because there's so much grease on it. But, uh, we get the Paul lever installed on that kind of in the opposite direction of the way it goes on the watch, because right now we're looking at this assembly upside down but we'll get that bridge on. And now I'm just going to move the C-clip over and then mess with it for five minutes, trying to get it lined up <laughs> before I put it on. But uh, once I kind of get it ready, I'll just put some plastic down and then just use my tweezers. There we go. I'll use my brass tweezers. There we go. And just press it into place. And that plastic just keeps that part from flying away. If I happen to slip or, you know, something happens, which, you know, that's happened before and I'm sure it'll happen again, but that plastic just, Saves you a lot of headache and a lot of sore knees going down on the floor trying to find parts. But with those done, now we can actually begin assembly of the watch. So I'm lubricating the underside of that center wheel. You don't have to do that on this step. You can actually lubricate it from the other side of the watch uh, later down, later on. But uh, I just do it there. I'll lubricate the top part of that where the center wheel bridge is going to connect to it. And we'll go ahead and get this center wheel bridge mounted. Get that kind of put into place. 
and that's held on by one screw. As I cinch this screw down, you can see that bridge is kind of seat right where it needs to be. And we'll go ahead and get that tightened up. Next thing I want to do while I don't have anything else on the watch is I just want to check in shake on this center wheel. And uh, it's just a lot easier to get to at this point before the rest of the stuff goes in. And that's actually looking pretty darn good. I'll, uh, I'll check in shake on the rest of the parts of the rest of the wheel train and the, the balance and the main spring barrel and all that once I get them installed, but it's just, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the way between the edge of that watch and that center wheel when you get everything else put in. So I just, it's convenient to do it there. But we've got the main spring barrel in and I'm just putting that escape wheel in. Now we can put in the dreaded third wheel. I hate this wheel. Actually been a few videos since I've explained that. Um, <laughs> long time ago, I was working on a, a similar Seiko movement and I didn't have the bottom pivot in the jewel properly when I went to put on the bridge and I tightened down the screw and then cracked the jewel. Um, pivot was damaged too. I had to uh, source a new jewel and uh, a new third wheel. And that actually was the first jewel I ever replaced. So, um, you know, a lot of lessons that at least I've learned in watchmaking have come from my own ignorance of the proper process. And so, uh, you know, and when that happens, it costs you money if you want to fix it. So that one cost me a little bit of money, but, uh, it was money well spent because I learned a good lesson. So, um, whenever I'm working on a third wheel of that type, especially on a Seiko, I'm reminded of that. And that's, that's why I hate that wheel, but, uh, <laughs> We got it all in. You actually saw me mess with it a little bit. We lay the, the bridge on here and I'm moving that click spring out of the way a little bit. So the bridge sits down and there it goes. Now I'm just going to tap on this a little bit and hope and pray that all the pivots line up, you know, 50, 50 chance, but, um, sometimes it, sometimes it works pretty well. So now I'm going to hold down pressure, just a light pressure on that. And then just, Turn that barrel and there we go. A little hiccup right at the very beginning. There may have been something just slightly off, but uh, everything kind of popped into place. As soon as I really started to, uh, you know, put some tension on that wheel train, it everything kind of went to where it needed to be. So that's good stuff. So I'm getting these three screws just uh, just in, but not torqued down. And I, I tested it again just to make sure that everything was still good and that train was turning freely. And then now we're just doing final tightening on those three screws. The next thing I want to do is I want to put a little dab of lubrication on the back side of this Paul lever. And when it's in its final place, it's going to kind of sit inside that little post that's sticking up there. Kind of watch that Paul lever where it kind of slides underneath that post right there. And it kind of, there's a little bit of movement in there. So I'm just lubricating that little bit of post on the post and the raceway for that second reduction wheel. And I'm, right now I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the upper barrel arbor port since we don't have a ratchet wheel on that. And you can see capillary action, pull that lubrication in. It's actually a pretty decent view of that right there. The microscope isn't making a lot of appearances lately, but um, I do actually almost, I mean, I'd say 98% of all my work, I'm actually looking through the microscope doing this. And sometimes I get kind of stuck in such a groove that uh, the microscope camera doesn't have autofocus and its focus is separate from the actual, you know, the optics on the microscope, the eyepieces that I'm looking through. So I may change something or move something around and adjust the microscope focus itself, but not mess with the camera. So sometimes there's a lot of footage that, uh, you know, I'm like, well, I can't use that on the channel because it's totally blurry. But, you know, when I was looking through the microscope, it looks just fine. But um, thankfully, I've got these other cameras now set up. So, uh, but sometimes there's just no good way of showing something, even with a really nice camera. As close up as that thing can go is about, it, it, that's just, that's preschool stuff to the microscope. So, because uh, it can go in way closer. So, there we go. We got the second reduction wheel in and I'm just kind of hand starting that reverse threaded screw. And we'll go ahead and get that tightened down as well. 
And so instead of the S4 grease that's on there, I'm actually going to use HP 1300. I've used this on quite a lot of watches too. I've read uh, some f- online where some folks were talking about, you know, them working on Seikos and some of them have a lot of, a lot more than I do under, you know, under their belts. And uh, everyone kind of, the consensus that I understand is that that's a pretty accepted practice. It works well. I've never had any issues using it there, but I'm just kind of working it in. And I'm also watching that ratchet wheel and that second reduction wheel where they are turning properly and only in one direction, regardless of which way I'm spinning this first reduction wheel. And that tells us that that Paul lever is working properly. So now I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the wheel train. And this is one of those parts where I can't use the microscope footage because it looked great in the eyepiece, but not on the camera because I didn't stop and manually adjust that focus. But uh, we'll flip that over. And we'll lubricate the wheel train on this side. I'm going to start with the lower pivots for the escape wheel, the first reduction wheel, and the third wheel. Um, Opposite order of what I just called out, but that's what those three are. And then I'm going to lubricate the main spring barrel arbor port, the lower arbor port. We don't have to lubricate the center wheel because we did that when we first installed it. And then the fourth wheel, which is the one the second hand is on the kind of the, the, Part of that pivot that it, where the lubrication is required, we, we did that before we pre-installed it. So we're good there. So now we can go ahead and install our pallet fork. And I'm doing this right-handed. I'm a left-handed. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lefty. So I'm doing this right-handed to try to get a good view on the camera. That was really awkward, but we got that pallet fork in there. And now I am trying to go ahead and get this bridge put into place very gently. There we go. Now just kind of work it around a little bit. And I just keep in this in one shot, just trying to keep these videos honest. You know, it's parts just don't always just drop in. You got to kind of work with them and be gentle with them. But you saw that bridge finally sit down right where it needs to go. So that's looking pretty good. Now go ahead and get these two screws put on. So right now I'm just screwing them all the way in, but not tightening them at all because we don't want this bridge to be kind of, you know, slanted or anything or more pressure on one side than the other, especially uh, before you get, you know, two screws down at least all the way. So I'm just gently doing that. Here's that second one. Now I can go ahead and tighten them properly. And I know it's zoomed in pretty far and it looks like I'm really cranking on those screws and I'm, I'm, I'm really not. Uh, I'm just kind of getting them snug, but it, it, it looks pretty tight and my shaky hands, sometimes I'm shaking on it. Actually, it looks like I'm really cranking on them, but it's really not the case. But now we need to lubricate the escapement. So I'm putting a very small dab. It's about as small as dab as I can do on the exit stone of that pallet fork. Once we had tension, obviously you saw me put some wines in the mainspring and just double check that pallet fork before we started. So we're applying this lubrication to five teeth at a time on this movement. There is 15 teeth on this pallet fork. And you know, some of the other high beat movements, you know, those things will have more teeth on their pallet fork. And you, I apply lubrication to them, um, you know, in, in different amounts. You know, I don't do five teeth at a time. But uh, I'll do this one here. This here's number three, a very light touch. There we go. And I'll apply this to the final five teeth. I'll just move it around. We'll keep the camera in here. And I'm also checking the lock depth on, on those things uh, th- this whole time. Uh, I haven't really explained that much in any of the previous videos. And generally, I'm on Seiko's. I can't remember, you know, I, ever really needing to adjust the the stone depth on a pallet fork. But uh, I mean, what you're really looking for is, um, you know, well, you know what, we'll get into that in a later video. That would that's a, That's a long discussion. So I'm installing the balance and it didn't want to kick up right away. And again, I keep this in one shot because when this balance fires up, it's interesting. Uh, at first I want to, I'm checking to see if it's overbanked or kind of what my situation here is. And then I just barely nudge the whole movement holder and then boom, it fires right up. So that kind of tells you that, I mean, it, there, the tolerances on this thing is so small between running and not running that, uh, you know, it was, in the place, but just the pivot must not have been just barely, barely off or just not in there completely all the way. And just a light nudge in the right direction 
there it goes and it fired right up. So that's great news. And take a look at that balance spring with it running. That thing is looking really good. Breathing just great. So I let this thing run for a while uh, before we put it on the time graph for, for 24 hours. But I I did an initial regulation and just ba set basic time, nothing final at all. And so here are those results. Lift angle on this particular movement is 53 degrees. And the lift angle adjustment will not change your rate or your beat error reading. The only thing the lift angle is going to adjust by moving it up or down is the amplitude. And there's a whole science and, you know, um, you know, a mathematical formula for what lift angle is, but that's a whole other video for another time. But if you'd like to read up on it, it's interesting. So this thing here is running pretty consistent, um, really good amplitude, you know, mid sixties for only after a day of running timekeeping is steady beat error is negligible. So, um, that's real great. I'm going to do final regulation on these, on this watch and all the watches I do, um, outside of like one piece cases like that Hamilton, once it gets cased up, because, uh, that can change a few things. Uh, you know, resonance will become a factor and you'll see, you could see different readings in the case and outside the case. So I always try to, you know, fine tune everything once it's in the case, if, and when at all possible. So we started by lubricating a couple ports here for the keyless works. I'm trying to lubricate this clutch wheel and it had a real weird angle on it. So I'm applying some grease to the sidewalls. I mean, you can get grease on that bottom part in that recess. It won't hurt anything, but that's not where the yoke makes contact. It touches the sides of those walls. So put a little bit of grease in there and then I'm applying a bit of grease to the tip of that setting lever. That's where it's going to engage with the clutch. It's a pretty high friction area. So go ahead and get the yoke in here. And I just realized I said, I was saying where it engages with the yoke, not engages with the clutch, but I, you know what I meant? So I fiddle with that for a minute and get it into place. And now I can apply some grease to the back side of that spring. And that's where it's going to make contact with that side wall of the main plate. So I'm going to hold this down so it doesn't move on the other end and go ahead and set tension on the spring right there. Now I can go ahead and with that giant glob of grease, I'm only using a bit of it, but those two kind of recesses on that yoke are the other stopping points, the first and the third position for where, when you pull the crown out, the, the, the uh, setting lever is going to engage with those. So I am just kind of putting some grease in there and I'm going to use some Rodico to just kind of touch up what's on top of that yoke. Now we can go ahead and put our setting lever spring put on. And this technically is a setting lever spring, although it really is just more of a cover plate than a spring, but it does, it puts downward pressure on that setting lever. And more commonly, uh, you know, when you hear or see a setting lever spring, that's also got, you know, kind of the, the parts on it where that yoke had the, you know, the three stop ping positions where the setting lever engages on that setting lever spring on more traditional movements you know, non Seikos and even some Seikos have it, but it's just a different setup, but mechanically it all works the same. So now we applied some grease to our stem and we're going to go ahead and get this put in. I'm just trying to line it up in that clutch wheel and then put it into place. And there it goes. So at this point here, I did a lot of testing, uh, you know, at first when we get here and then especially when I get the hand and pinion in the minute wheel put on, I test this thing thoroughly because of how difficult those hands were. But at this stage right now, um, it's turning real freely. If there's any bind up, it's not going to be caused by any of these parts. So now we're going to apply some grease here and install our cannon pinion. If you take a look back on the video, when we pulled it off, take a look at how that cannon pinion looked before and how it looks now. Uh, cause that thing had cleaned up, but, um, that widest surface, you know, just like a third of its length down from the top, that was real dark and dull and had a lot of wear on it. It looks like, and I think there was um, a lack of lubrication the last time it was assembled and may have been the cause, but uh, that thing's looking great now. So we're assembling the rest of the calendar works here. The post for the calendar or the, the calendar driving wheel and then the post for the intermediate wheel and some HP 1300 here to the outside of that Canon pinion where the power wheel is going to go. There's our calendar driving wheel right there and our intermediate wheel. And that's got, you know, 
two, basically two pinions on it. There's a smaller one on the underside of that, that that calendar wheel works, engages with. And then the hour wheel, just want to make sure that it's engaged with both the minute wheel and the intermediate calendar wheel. And that there is our date driving wheel. And that's looking pretty good. Now we can put on our date jumper. So a little bit of lubrication on the post where it rotates. We'll go ahead and set that in place, but I'm not gonna set the spring tension on just yet. I wanna put a little bit of grease there on the edge of this. There we go. And here's another, hey, I remembered to focus the microscope. <laughs> so there we go, we get that put into place and then I'll clean up the excess grease on the main plate with some Rodico. There we go, that's looking pretty good. Now we can put on our date wheel. We get that put into place and you need the date jumper to that lever to pull it back and then bring it back forward where it's set in between two teeth of that date wheel, just like that. And with that in place, we can go ahead and put our cover plate on. And if memory serves, I think actually Seiko actually calls that cover plate a date dial guard. So um, something like that, but I mean, that cover plate, uh, it, I mean, it, it is what it is. It's a cover plate, but it also is a hold down. And so the teeth for that date wheel ride on the underside of that plate. So it keeps that wheel from lifting upwards. So I'm putting these first two screws in and for whatever reason, I decided to kind of pre-start those. Uh, I don't know. It ended up taking way longer to do that than it would be to just screw them down because I pre pre did them. And then I screw these two screws down and get them both flush and then I go back and then retighten them again. So I basically had, you know, it made no sense. I was regretting it as soon as I finished it. I'm like, well, that was a dumb thing to do, but it doesn't hurt anything. I spent more time <laughs> talking about how it was a poor decision than it actually, than the amount of extra time it took to actually do it. So I'm applying a very light amount of 9010 to that date jumper. And you can watch me make a mistake here that I don't actually initially catch, but I wanted to leave it in the video just because it's something that can happen. And it happened to me here, especially when you're looking at these watches directly overhead, this is not an easy thing to catch. So I got that first screw in and I'm going to get this second screw in. And what I want you to watch is that post on the left, right there where that arrow is. It didn't, the, you know, the, it, the, 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 that part did not seat down over that post properly. And I tightened down that screw. And so that post is actually, that whole part is lifted up like on the left edge of your screen. It affects nothing right now. It's gonna work fine. And so I'm, I'm checking the function of the, the, you know, the rotation of the date, date wheel and making sure it's works in both quick set and then manual winding of the watch. And by the way, at manual winding or, or manual time setting now feels excellent. It was just a, a very, very, very dry cannon pinion causing those problems. So, and I still hadn't seen it yet, but you see where that part is lifted up on its edge. That's going to come into play here real soon. And I don't catch it right away, but I'm installing the day driving wheel. And we have to have that cover plate on first. And now we can install our day wheel. And so I wrote, put it in and I rotate it around where the big hole is visible uh, with that spring. And I'll go ahead and set that spring for that part that's improperly installed and a very, very light amount of 9010 on the sides there, just a tiny, tiny bit. And then the C-clip. And what you'll notice right now, take a look at like where it says Friday on that watch. See how that wheel is kind of higher on that one side, right there on that where that arrow is. What's gonna happen is that since that part is pushing up on that day wheel, when I try to adjust it, see how it's taking for freaking ever to, manually set this day. The semi quick sets not functioning that great and it's rotating like six hours in order to try to get the next day to come, you know, to jump over. That is definitely wrong. So as soon as I saw that, I kind of, you know, pulled the watch apart. I mean, put it, looked at it on its profile and saw that that was sitting high. So I pulled the, the parts off, saw that wheel, that part was riding up high on its edge and reinstalled everything. And now this is what it should look like properly. So that wheel sitting, that date wheel or the day wheel sitting flat and you see how the semi quick set is working. You set the date, 
reset the day and then turn it back and then move forward again. And you can move through the days pretty quickly. So now this thing's functioning perfectly and just double checking the date quick set as well. So now we're good to go. And here's a good view. You can see how flat that wheel is sitting all the way around that day wheel. So now we can install the dial. So I put the dial ring back on and then install those as a unit. And I'm just tightening those dial feed screws. Now I'm just going to go through with a kind of a, either some Ronico or I've got these soft sticky uh, swabs that uh, are very, very gentle. And I'm just removing any, any specks of anything that can be removed on this dial. This dial is in like 99% good condition. There's just a few very, very light, tiny marks on it that are, have, have gone through the, the coat, but this dial's 50 years old or, you know, so, I mean, that's phenomenal. So I rotated the watch around till I found midnight and now we're installing the hour hand. It looked like it was basically there. I'm going to give it kind of one more, one more nudge. There we go. That's looking pretty good. And setting the minute hand. And it's been about one minute since I put the hand on versus when I'm pressing it down. So that's why it looks like it's a minute off. But there's that. And now the seconds hand. And very light press. It does not take much. You definitely don't want to muscle these at all. And one of the hardest things for me personally, and still one of the things that makes me most nervous is putting hands on. Uh, you know, because I've, I've been too heavy handed before I've had some where they're, they're, they're hard to go on and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to muscle anything on a watch. It shouldn't need to be, but, um, hands always make me nervous. Even, uh, I've done so many of them, they make me nervous. So it's time to replace this crystal and the original crystal I got, uh, there's another view of that scratch. The first replacement crystal we found, um, wasn't the easiest one to find. It was not inexpensive either. And when I got it in, it was the wrong crystal. So what I, we ended up doing, and I'm still trying to get a refund on that one. So this one is the same crystal, but with a gold tension ring instead of silver. And they made multiple models of these watches, some with gold, some with silver. So I got this in. And so what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to pull this silver tension ring out of the original crystal. And we're going to install this in place of the gold one on the brand new crystal. So if we can't order the right part, by gosh, we'll make one. <laughs> Whenever we can, we got to figure out some way to make it, you know, we'll get it done one way or another. So I'm being very gentle because um, I don't want to put any marks on this crystal. These are acrylic crystals. I don't want to, you know, scratch or anything. I mean, because brass tweezers can scratch it. So like I'm, I'm being super gentle. But now that we got the gold one out, we'll go ahead and put the silver one in. And these just press into place. And thankfully, uh, you know, it was a good tight fit inside that crystal. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't want it to be, you know, if it was, I was just hoping that it wouldn't be loose or something, but, uh, it's a good tight squeeze. And now I'm just gently pressing that in and rotating that around and just working that crystal down. And that's got a good tight seal in there. So there we go. Brand new crystal, no more cracks and a, the correct silver tension ring. Even though we couldn't find the right part number, we, you know, we found a solution. So now we can go ahead and case this movement. And I've got some, I cleaned the inside of that crystal and I cleaned the dial, but there's some, you know, some dust and stuff on the outside of that crystal. It, uh, I really need to be a bit, a bit more thorough with that. Is this, I mean, is that 4K camera up close, you see, I see it better there than I'm working on it when I'm working on it in person. I didn't even see those when I was there in person. I saw the big one, but um, I need to wipe those down really at this point, just for the sake of the video, you know, because it cleans off in two seconds. But uh, I'd like for the video, you know, I'd like it to be spotless. So we applied some silicone grease uh, to the replacement gasket, and then I reapplied some of the grease for the keyless works. I mean, there's already some in the parts, but I basically took it all off with my hands when I was putting the, the gasket on. So I reapplied a very small amount. I don't want to over grease it because there's, you know, there's already some in the clutch wheel and everything else, but uh, get that in there. That thing was a real tight fit, by the way, too. That's good. That That's a good seal on that gasket. Now we got a movement ring put back in. So now we're going to go ahead and apply silicone grease to the new case back gasket. 
and that fits inside of a channel between the case and the movement ring. There's that kind of creates a little channel where that gasket can sit. And now we need to align this um, oscillating weight properly. So drew some arrows here. You need that arrow of the first reduction wheel to be in line with the hairspring stud and the, the center of the oscillating weight needs to be in line with the crown. You know, when you tighten it down, that's the proper alignment. Uh, so I just try to get it as close as possible to that. And then it's going to move around and all that, but it's basically already in its place. And I'm going to go ahead and tighten this down and spin it around a little bit and make sure it feels good that there's not much play in that bearing. We don't need to tighten anything up. Then I'm going to move this back around real quick and just check alignment. And that's looking really, really good. And I'm just going to lubricate a couple of these ball bearings in here. And there we go. Made a bit of a mess there, but no big deal. We'll go ahead and clean that up a little bit with some, with some Rodico. And at this point, you know, I've, I've done final regulation at this point. Uh, and so we're all good to go there. That, that did get done. So now our case back is going to go on. And we'll move it over to the proper tool to go ahead and do this. So we just protect everything with plastic top and bottom, just to be safe. There's plenty of scratches on this case, but they're, they're from wear and, uh, and life. And I don't want any additional ones coming from, from me. So now we can go ahead and tighten this thing down properly. There we go. Got a nice tight fit on it. And now it's time to go ahead and install the bracelet on this thing. So I cleaned up the bracelet very thoroughly. Um, I even removed the links and, uh, you know, cleaned all the, the pins and everything because it was real filthy. Got a new set of spring bars as well. And I'm fiddling with this spring bar trying to get it in because I've got it seated in way too deep. I actually need to adjust it closer to the edge. There it goes. Same thing with this one. Brand new spring bars. We'll go ahead and get this in. It was close, but I'm, I keep pushing it down and I'm pushing it in the wrong direction. Then I just use the bracelet to adjust it and boom, there it goes. So that's it. That's how the watch ended up. I really like it. I mean, man, that thing's sharp. It's an honest wear. It, 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 you know, it's just great. And so but right before I left town, I met up with my friend Gave him his watch back to him, and here he is wearing it. Uh, I've spoken with him since. He says he's keeping great time. He's been wearing it, and uh, I sure think it turned out well. So there you go. You're now famous on YouTube. Your wrist is famous, and your watch is famous at least. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate you watching. Um, thank you so much for your time. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to see more, and uh, we're going to do another giveaway real soon, I think, or when we hit 5,000 subscribers. So. That'll be a fun one. Thanks again, everybody. Take care. We'll see you on the next one.